Así que con eso, Julie, te pido por favor que nos responda la pregunta, ¿cómo hacer para que nuestros hijos nos escuchen? Ah, y solamente una cosa antes, Julie, quiero darle la bienvenida a todos los colegios que hoy día están con nosotros, papás, mamás, profesores de Chile, de México, que nos están acompañando y que nos juntamos para poder juntar y escuchar a Yuli. Yuli, por favor, adelante. Thank you. Muchas gracias y buenas tardes. <risa> Estudié español en escuela hace como 40 años, entonces voy a hablar en inglés. Pero... <risa> ok, empezamos. Let's go. So... When I think about what our goals are as parents for our children, I think that we have two goals I'm going to suggest. The first goal is for the present. I think we want to get through the day to manage all those little conflicts that come up without ending up feeling miserable and angry, right? We want to get through the day and survive the moment. The second goal is for the future. We want our children to grow up to have a strong sense of who they are and what they're capable of. And we want them to care about other people and know how to resolve conflicts peacefully. Well, it turns out that the way that we handle all the small daily conflicts can help kids grow up to be people who can handle grown-up conflicts with strength and caring and respect. But I'm gonna suggest that for most of us, when our kids are little, we're pretty strongly focused on just getting through the day, right? When people hear the title of my book, How to Talk So Little Kids Will Listen, they often say to me, I want that. I want my kids to listen. And what they mean is I want my kids to behave, right? I want them to obey, to do as I say. So the first big idea I wanna to talk to you about is that there's a connection between how kids feel and how they behave. In fact, we can say more generally, there's a connection between how people feel and how people behave. If you think about those times when you haven't been your best self as a parent, you know what I'm talking about. Those moments when maybe you're glad you didn't accidentally leave the Zoom camera and microphone on, you know, when you screamed at your kids or called them lazy or mean, or you threatened that if you don't come now, I'm leaving without you. And you wish that you could. Those times tend to be when you aren't feeling your best, right? Maybe you're feeling stressed because you're late to work again, or you've had an argument with your spouse, or you're overtired, or you just need a moment to yourself without someone hanging on you or whining. Those are the times when we parents tend to lose it with our kids, right? Well, what's true for us is true for our kids as well. Kids don't behave right when they don't feel right. So if we want them to behave right, we need to help them feel okay. And how do we do that? Well, one important way is to accept their feelings. Now, most of us don't find this hard to do when the feelings are positive. Oh, you love your pancakes for breakfast? You're excited about the new blocks you got for your birthday? You love your baby brother? How nice, I'm so glad to hear it. But when the feelings are negative, we often run into trouble. You changed your mind, you don't want pancakes for breakfast, but they're your favorite. You wanted Legos for your birthday, not blocks. You should be grateful you got anything. You hate your brother, that's a terrible thing to say. I do not want to hear you talking about that, like that about your brother again. We don't want to accept negative feelings because they're so negative. It turns out that accepting a child's feelings can often be hard to do. And it can be counterintuitive, especially when they're having negative feelings we don't want them to have. We want to push those feelings away, explain why they shouldn't feel so bad. And I think we do these things automatically. We discourage angry emotions. We try to protect our kids from sad emotions. We try to dismiss what we see as trivial emotions. We don't want to reinforce them. To acknowledge them seems almost counterintuitive. And how we talk to our kids affects how they feel. But I don't want you to just take my word for this. I've learned it can help to test words out on ourselves to see how they make us feel. I wanna do that with you right now. 
uh, this is a short version of an exercise I do in my live workshops, because I want you to experience for yourself how it feels when someone denies your negative feelings. So for purposes of this exercise, I want you to imagine that you're a preschool teacher, unless you are one, in which case you could just be a preschool teacher. But imagine that you wake up one morning and you're feeling lousy. You didn't get enough sleep last night. You can feel a headache coming on. So you stop to get some coffee at the local coffee shop before you go to work and you run into a coworker. I'm gonna play the part of your coworker. And you say to me, boy, I don't want to go to work today and face all those loud, quarrelsome kids. I just want to go home, take some Tylenol for my aching head, and spend the day in bed. Okay, imagine that as your coworker, I say to you, I'm going to try to help you out of your negative feelings by denying your feelings. And I say, hey, stop complaining. The kids aren't that bad. You'll have a good time once you get there. Come on, let me see that smile. Now, when I do this exercise with a group of parents and I ask them, what's your immediate gut reaction? How does it make you feel? Very few people say, that was helpful. That made me feel better. No, the typical response, and I'm imagining many of you are having this right now, is you don't get it. I don't want to talk to you. I'm feeling guilty about having told you, having these feelings. Uh, it makes me feel angry. Sometimes people say to me, are we allowed to curse here? Right? And then some people say, it makes me feel embarrassed. I don't want to talk to you anymore. If you think about all of these typical reactions, these are not the kinds of things we want our kids to feel when we talk to them, right? We don't want them to feel like they don't want to talk to us, that they want to curse at us, right? So here's the harder question. What do we say to kids that sounds like we're denying their feelings? Or maybe we don't say these things, but what do people say to kids that might sound like their feelings are being denied? I have a few examples for you to think about. One is this is the basic, shh, don't cry, it's okay. Picture the child who has been running and he falls and scrapes his knee and he's crying and we take a look and there's no blood and we say, it's okay, you're okay, but it hurts and he's crying. It, at best, it makes no sense to him. It feels like it's wrong. Why is, why is she saying it's okay? Or sometimes when we tell it's the child, it's okay, they will escalate. It's not okay, it hurts, and they'll feel even more, like they have to convince us, right? Or here's another example. <laughs> Imagine saying to a child, you do not hate her, you played so nicely with her before. Now that child who's just told you how much she hates her, her little sister, is, how likely is it that she's gonna say, oh yeah, I was playing with her nicely before, oh, you're right, I don't really hate her very unlikely right because in that moment she's feeling angry or i got this from another parent but you like macaroni and cheese this is just a different shape pasta it tastes exactly like macaroni again very unlikely that the child is going to change their mind and say oh oh well in that case it's i'm cool with it or my sister once said to me julie calm down i immediately escalated if you think that i should be calm then you don't understand the severity of the situation I totally escalated because I felt like she doesn't get it. I shouldn't be calm. Okay, so oh, I wanted to try give you another one because I got this one from uh, a bunch of parents who tell me when a child says, I hate school, I don't want to go. And the parent responds, you don't really hate school. You'll have fun once you get there. You know you like playing with the blocks. I couldn't even drag you out of there yesterday, right? Has any child ever responded, Oh yeah, you're right. You just reminded me that I do love school. No, the more that we try to push away those negative feelings, the more the other person gets entrenched. They have to convince us, I don't want to go to school, but you like school. No, I don't, I hate it. I'm never going away. I'm never going again. Okay, let's try a different approach. Let's go back to the coffee shop. And when I ask you how you're doing and you tell me, instead of denying your feelings, I'm gonna ask you a series of questions. Now you have to imagine that we're having a conversation and you answer me as I ask you, but put yourself back in the coffee shop with, with me, your coworker. And I say to you, are you getting enough sleep? Hmm, well, what time did you get to bed last night? Did you take any cold medicine? 
well, why haven't you been using those hand wipes they have at the school so you won't catch germs from the kids? Okay, now notice your gut reaction. Do you appreciate my questions? Or as most people tell me, does it feel like I, she thinks I'm doing it wrong? I feel judged. She thinks I'm stupid or it feels like an interrogation and I feel defensive. I feel criticized. Uh, so again, do we ask our kids questions when they're upset? All the time. Why can't you be nice to your brother? He just wants to play with you. Or why are you crying? Even questions like that, which we ask out of caring, can feel like an interrogation to a child. They might feel like, I don't know if I have a good enough reason to be crying, or I don't even know how to explain it. So, and the why questions are, I would say the most dangerous. They really can put a child on the defensive. And of course, it's natural for us parents to wanna to know more. I'm not suggesting that we shouldn't ask our kids questions, but our timing is critical. If you feel the urge to ask a question, see if it, instead of asking the question, you can turn it into a statement. So instead of saying, honey, why are you crying? You can say, oh, you're crying. Can you hear how that's an invitation for a child to tell you more, but it's not a demand? Or if you, when I say, what happened? Instead, you can turn it into a statement and say, something happened. Again, it's an invitation to a child to tell you if they're ready without demanding it from them. So if you are a question asker, as many of us are, why did you do that? Why didn't you stop when you were supposed to? Well, that's not even really a question. <laughs> why did you make a mess, right? These are questions that are really expressions of our frustration, but even our genuine questions of wanting to know what happened, what, you know, wh why are you crying? We can turn them into statements so that a child doesn't feel defensive. Um, okay, let me try a different approach. Back at the coffee shop, imagine I try a philosophical lecture and I say to you, hey, no job is perfect, that's just life. There's no use complaining about it. If you dwell on negative feelings, you'll become a negative person. People who focus on being grateful and feeling grateful, they make the best of whatever life gives them. Did that make you feel better? Most people tell me it doesn't. <laughs> they say either it makes me feel guilty or I hate you, or this is depressing if this is what life is like, or just that I feel dismissed and my feelings don't matter. So again, what do we say to children that might sound like this? We might, it's, it's things like, honey, it's not such a big deal. You can't always get what you want. Or here's another example. After the soccer game, the kids come to you crying. And he said, and, and we, honey, honey, you win some, you lose some. You can't win every game. I'm not suggesting that we don't want to teach our kids these important life lessons. It's true, if you're playing a win-lose game that somebody's gonna win and somebody's gonna lose. The problem is if that's the first thing we say to a child who's full of hard feelings, they're not gonna take it in. They're not gonna hear it. They're not gonna learn what you want them to learn. Okay, of what, I'll, I'll just share one more. My dad used to say to us, well, look, life isn't fair. You gotta stop it with the, he gets, you know, he got more, hers is better sort of thing. You know, and I can tell you that I never thought to myself, well, you know, I was upset, but now that you've explained that to me, that life isn't fair, I feel so much better. Thanks, Dad. No, I just, I thought, well, you're in charge. You should be trying to make it as fair as possible. I thought it was a complete cop out. Okay, let me try one more approach back at the coffee shop. Imagine instead of all that other stuff, I say, I acknowledge your feelings by saying, ugh, it's awful to have to go to work when you don't feel good, especially when you work with kids. What we need is a big storm that would knock the power out just long enough to close the school for the day. What was your reaction now? Most people say to me, oh, such a relief after all those other statements. Yes, you get it. And I forgot to tell you something else that happened this morning, right? So it's often an invitation. It feels like an invitation, like oh, I'm so grateful that somebody gets how I'm feeling. Okay, so in our book, we have a bunch of tools, various ways that you can acknowledge a child's feelings. And I'm gonna share with you a couple of them. The first one is to acknowledge feelings with words. So I want you to listen to the difference between what we wanna say and what children need to hear. 
Imagine a child says, this puzzle is too hard. What do we want to say? Oh, look, it's easy here. I'll help you. The problem is no child ever took heart from hearing that what he is struggling with is easy for others. So what will give him the strength to go on is to hear, ooh, that does look hard. There are so many little pieces that look alike. It could drive you crazy trying to find the right one. Or when our child says, Ma, I lost my favorite Lego guy. What do we want to say? Oh, please, you have zillions of those pesky little vacuum hazards. But it will help him calm down more quickly if we say, Oh, no, that one was really special to you. You really like the little helmet and the sword. Or when your child says, I don't want to sing in the show. Right? We want to reassure her. Oh, you'll do fine. There's nothing to worry about. You have a beautiful voice. But it will actually give her more courage to get on stage if her feelings are accepted. It can be scary to be in front of a lot of people. But what if your child says, I hate Sammy? What do we want to say? Don't say that. You know you love your little brother. You have to be more patient with him. He's only two. But it will actually help her feel better towards her brother if you acknowledge her feelings. You sound very frustrated with your younger brother right now. It's not easy to live with a two-year-old. It's hard to protect your stuff. A mom told me she acknowledged her son's feelings, but it only made him more irritated. When I asked her to tell me what she said to him, she said, okay, I can see that you're angry. And now I hope in the translation you can hear how her words seem to accept her feeling, but her tone of voice is saying, calm down, calm down. So our attitude and our, our tone of voice is important. You have to mean it. Otherwise, a kid will experience it as phony or manipulative. So it's important to match the emotion and be genuine. Ooh, you are so angry. Okay, I want to share with you a few stories that parents have written to us since the book came out telling us how they've used this tool with their actual kids. The first story I want to share with you was posted on Facebook. It goes like this. Yesterday, my daughter, Lena, asked for waffles for breakfast, but once they were on the table, she desperately wanted pancakes. Previously, I may have tried various techniques to get her to eat that breakfast. Come on, honey, I already made you waffles. There's no time for pancakes now. Besides, you asked for waffles. And how likely is that gonna work, right? <laughs> this time, I just acknowledged her feelings. Here's how the conversation went. Lena, I don't want waffles, I want pancakes. Me. Gosh, that's frustrating. You really want pancakes. I can see how upset you are. Lena, I am upset. Oh, look, a squirrel. And she started eating her waffles, tantrum averted. Okay, doesn't always go that easily, but it can. Here's another true story. This one's sent to be by a mother who took a workshop with me. So she said, my son, who's six, had been not wanting to take a shower because he had a very bad experience in the swimming pool. This went on for days and days. I tried telling him that the shower is very different from the swimming pool and he wasn't gonna go underwater in the shower and he's very safe in the shower, all of that, but he was still putting up a big fight when it was time for a shower. After attending your workshop, I stopped trying to talk him into taking a shower and I just acknowledged his feelings. I said, it's really scary to take a shower after you got hurt in the swimming pool. And he said, yes, mommy, I really don't like taking showers anymore. I said, the shower makes you think about the swimming pool. And that was scary. If it was up to you, you'd never take another shower ever again. Well, we need to take showers because otherwise we'll stink. What should we do about this? And you know what he said? That's okay, mom. I was just kidding. I'll take the shower. He didn't cry or complain while taking his shower. After that, I was absolutely stunned. So we want to explain to our kids why they don't have to be scared. It seems counterintuitive to acknowledge that they're scared, and yet accepting the feelings allows them to move through it and let it go. I have one more story, which I call the green line story. So this is about a little boy named Raul, who's almost four, and he has this little notebook that he loves scribbling in with a pen, and he filled up an entire page with his writing, writing. And the next thing I know, he's crying because there's a green line on the page. So mom says, what's wrong? The whole page is ruined. There's a green line on my writing. Normally, mom says, this is where I'd say things like, 
it's not such a big deal. You can turn the page and write on the next page. Besides, you made the green line. Not that that would have helped. <laughs> this time I tried acknowledging the feelings. Oh no, that's not what you want. No, you wanted a clean write page of writing and pen. Yeah, now the whole thing is ruined. He stopped crying, but he was still upset. What can we do? It won't erase. My two-year-old was listening this whole time. He picked up a piece from a board game. We have pieces of board games all over the house. There's no way anyone can ever play these games for real anymore. And he put it on top of the green line and said, tape it. Now Raul really likes tape, so he was enthusiastic about this idea. My two-year-old ran to get another piece, another board piece, like I said, they're all over the place, and taped it on top of the green line. Raul was very satisfied with this. It was an amazing save. Okay, so those are all examples of acknowledging feelings with words. We have another tool for you, which is we call giving a child in fantasy what you can't give in reality. And I had a mom in one of my groups who took this tool and used it, applied it at a hard moment in the car. So she said she has a three-year-old, here's her story. She's a three-year-old Benjamin, found a penny at the park and put it in his pocket. He and his mom were driving home and he wanted the penny, but he couldn't get it out of his pocket because he was strapped into his car seat. He's, he was starting to scream and cry about it. And normally his mom would have told him, it's okay, we can get it when we get home, which she admitted probably wouldn't have helped. Or she would have tried to fish out a coin to give him while she was driving. You know, have you ever done that? Reaching over and trying to get something while you're driving, uh, which, which would have endangered the other people on the road. But this time, she remembered the idea of giving a wish in fantasy. She said, this is so frustrating. You know what I wish? What? I wish I had a button right here. And she pointed to a spot on the dashboard. Oops, sorry, on the dashboard in front of her. So I can't see with my camera. Benjamin stared at the spot and, and the mom went on. And whenever I pushed that button, heaps and heaps of pennies would come pouring out over here. And she pointed to a spot in the, in the ceiling of the car. Not just pennies, but every kind of coin, even coins from other countries, and they would all fall right into your lap. Benjamin listened wide-eyed. And you would have so much money, you could buy anything you wanted. What would you buy with all that money? A really big teddy bear. Oh, how big? As big as you? Yeah. At this point, he was really into the fantasy and very happy. And he didn't lose it over the penny, which she said, and I quote, is pretty amazing if you know my son. Okay, here's one more story of giving in fantasy. There, we had a teacher in a workshop reporting that she had a kid who was very upset that they were all out of chocolate milk at lunchtime. She tried telling him, it's not such a big deal. You'll survive without chocolate milk for one afternoon. And then the kid started yelling, no, I won't. So she, she said, I remembered that tool about giving wishes in fantasy. And I said to him, you know what I wish? I wish I had a magic wand and I could go zoop and I could make chocolate milk appear. How much would you like? A cup or maybe a gallon? Or how about a swimming pool? Listen, when you're giving in fantasy, you don't have to be cheap. She said, you could be floating in the swimming pool. And when you're thirsty, just. And the kid laughed and he took a regular milk. So the moral of this story is that it's easier for children to accept our limitations when we accept their feelings. So um, children depend on us to name their feelings and accept their feelings so that they find out who they are. If we don't, our unspoken message is, you don't mean what you say, you don't know what you know, you don't feel what you feel, you can't trust your own senses. When we give them the language for their feelings, we're also laying the groundwork for a person who can respect and not dismiss other people's needs and feelings. Now, sometimes parents ask me about the scientific evidence for different parenting styles. I wanna take a moment to tell you about a study by John Gottman. He's a prominent researcher in child psychology, and he calls this kind of talk emotion coaching. 
he's done studies comparing different types of parenting. One type he calls emotionally dismissive. Those are parents who either ignored their children's negative feelings or became irritated or angry at their children for express expressing negative feelings. They say things like, you're wrong to feel that way. That's foolish. You have no right to feel that way. There's no reason to be so upset. You're overreacting, that sort of thing. Another style he called emotion coaching. Parents who acknowledge their children's feelings and help them identify what they were feeling. They would say things like, ooh, that could be upsetting, or that sounds frustrating, or that's so disappointing. Now his results showed that children whose feelings were identified and accepted had an enormous advantage. They had longer attention spans, they did better on their achievement tests, they got along better with their peers, their teachers, their parents. They were more resistant to infectious diseases and even their urine was superior. They had fewer stress hormones in their urine. So forget about test scores. If you want your children to have superior urine, you should try this. <laughs> okay, but we can't just talk about feelings. We also need to get kids to do things that kids are deeply uninterested in doing. We adults worry about time, telling them to hurry up, don't be late. We talk about cleanliness, washing hands, brushing teeth, taking a bath. Think about it. What little kid sees the point? Now, I'm sure that nobody here wanted to become a parent so you could spend your time struggling to get your kids to do things. We'd all like to get through the day without it feeling like a series of unpleasant conflicts. But there's so many things we need them to do. And it seems like the most efficient way to get kids to do things is to tell them, put the cat down, get your coat on. No, not later, now. The problem is commands like this just create more resistance. Now we're battling with our kids. And often for a little extra flair, we add a threat to our command. We call it a consequence over here. If you throw sand one more time, I'm taking you straight home. The problem here is that when you say this, your child doesn't hear the whole sentence. You know what they hear? What they picture? Throw sand one more time. Young children are especially concrete thinkers. When they hear the words throw sand, they, figure, they have to figure out what that means by doing it. So kids feel compelled. What we intended as a threat can feel like an irresistible challenge. Let's try a little thought experiment. Imagine you come home from work and your partner says to you, oh good, you're home. Uh-uh, don't touch the computer. Please go hang up your coat, wash your hands and come set the table. Did I tell you to look at the mail? Put it down now. Hurry up, dinner's gonna be ready soon. Did you hear me? I said now. Well, kids have the same resentful, defiant feelings that we adults get when people order us around. When we give children commands, we're working against ourselves. Where we had it hoped to inspire obedience, we've just stirred up rebellion in their little hearts. So we have a lot of ideas in our book for how to, you can help kids to feel cooperative. I don't have time to talk about them all, but I'm gonna mention some of my favorites. The first of which is to be playful. Now many, many or some of you are thinking, I'm not really the playful type. Or maybe you're even wondering, what does that even mean? Am I supposed to be playful when my kid's driving me nuts? So I have a few specific ideas to help you get started. And the first one is to make an inanimate object talk. It's a surefire hit with most of the preschool crowd. So instead of clamping down on your three-year-old's leg saying, hold still while I get these socks on, don't you dare kick me, you'll have better luck if you animate the sock and make it talk to the child. Oh, I feel so flat. Won't somebody put a foot in me? you suddenly have a child who is delighted to jam his foot in the sock. I had a mom in my workshop who would get into massive battles with her children about cleaning up the blocks. It felt like a moral imperative. She'd say things like, come on, I told you already, you have to put away the blocks before you pull out another toy. They'd run away, she'd get annoyed. At one point she said she literally tried to take their hands in hers and put it on top of the block and grab it and <laughs> put it, get, make them put it away. But she said it just wasn't efficient. So after I gave her this idea of making an inanimate object talk, she really went to town. And she said she put, picked up the block bag and made it talk. I'm hungry, feed me blocks. 
and the kids started throwing colored blocks into her bag. Mmm, yum! A, a green one, that's delicious! No, not the pink one! Ah, it makes me want to throw up! Suddenly, she had all her kids running around stuffing blocks into the bag. They had so much fun, they poured out all the blocks so they could do it again. <laughs> Okay, so another way to be playful is to make something to a game or a challenge. Instead of telling the, your kids, this room is a pigsty, you need to clean up or I'm throwing these toys away. You can tell them, let's set the timer. How many toys do you think you can toss in a basket in one minute? Are you ready? Hold on. Ready, set, go. Or you might say, let's have a race. I bet you can't get all the Legos away before I finish cutting the carrots and peppers for dinner. Ready, set, go. Now, of course, you are gonna be racing against your child and you will lose. And then you can pretend to cry. Ah, how do you get to be so fast? It's no fair. And then kids will laugh at you because they know that you're the all powerful one. <laughs> they never get to see you cry. So being playful changes the whole mood because a day can get pretty grim for a kid who's being told what to do all day. And let's face it, it can get grim for an adult trying to get the kids to do all these things all day. When you use playfulness, it puts everyone in better spirits and it makes kids feel cooperative and it makes them feel more loving and connected, right? Who could argue with that? Okay, here's a story from a dad who took the, uh, a workshop with his wife. He, he wrote to me, he said, we live in a small house. The kids had pulled out everything they own and it was all over the floor. The inside of the house looked like a yard sale. The kids refused to clean up they were running around screaming, and my wife, Nikki, she couldn't take it anymore. She went in our bedroom and shut the door. I yelled at the kids to clean up the mess, which had no effect except that Nikki opened the door and just to say, that's not in the workshop, and she shut the door again. <laughs> so this gave me an idea. I picked up a little plastic brontosaurus and I made it talk. I want to go back where I came from. Our two-year-old immediately stopped running around, grabbed the brontosaurus and threw it, put it away. The five-year-old saw this, like he wasn't sure what, what to make of this. But then when he saw his brother getting into the action, he decided he wanted to clean up too. So I kept picking things up and making them talk. And bonus, my wife opened the door and said, nice, that's from the workshop. <laughs> okay, another tool I wanna to offer to you is to put the child in charge. Parents sometimes say to me, he just wants to be in control. Well, let's put him in control. How else will he grow up and learn responsibility? So if you have an older child who you can put them in charge of timers, visual timers are great. They help make an abstract idea of time more concrete. Because really, what's 15 minutes to a kid? If you need to leave to pick up brother, you can tell your child, we can leave now or we can leave in a rush in five minutes. You're in charge of the timer, you tell me. I actually had a mom of a two and a half year old who said she was having trouble leaving her in the morning when she was dropping her off at school because she didn't want mommy to go. So they changed the routine and mom told her daughter, you pushed me out the door. She said this worked much better. Put her in charge. Another tool we have for engaging our kids cooperation is to give kids choices. Most kids like to have a say in what they do or how they do it. And one way to do that is to give them choices. Now, you may be thinking, oh, there is no choice. She has to take a bath. She has mud in her hair. Or he has to get in the car seat. His brother is waiting at pickup. Okay, they might, there may not be a choice about whether there's going to be a bath or we have to get in the car, but we can give them a choice about how they do these things. Do you want to take a bath with your rubber duckies? Or do you want to get the measuring cups? Should we sing while you take a bath? Or should we make up a story about cats? I used to ask my daughter, do you want to have a leisurely soak or would you prefer to have what I call a hose down? She always preferred the hose down. If you're trying to get your kids to put their PJs instead of yelling at them to put them on now, you can try, do you want to put your PJs on the regular way or do you want to put them on backwards tonight or maybe inside out? Do you want to do it with your eyes open or with one eye shut? If you need to get your child into the car, you can give them a choice. How do you want to get to the car? Do you want to walk forwards or backwards? One mom in my group asked her daughter, do you want to climb into the car the regular way or do you want to go through the trunk? You can guess which she chose. One important point to remember about choices is that 
Both choices should be acceptable to both parent and child. Don't say you can do your homework now or no TV for the rest of the week. That's really not a choice. That's I would call that a threat. And don't say you can get in the car or I can leave you at the park for the wild dogs to chew on. <laughs> and don't do what one mother told her daughter. You can hold my hand while we walk down the street or I can give you a smack. You decide. That is not the sort of choice I'm talking about. OK, this brings me to my last topic for today. Kids can get you so angry, so resentful, so frustrated that the urge to punish is hard to resist. You've read the book. You've studied the book. Now you just want to hit them with the book. <laughs> but I'm here to tell you that children can be raised without punishment. I want to talk to you about one very useful alternative that we talk about in our book. But first, let's just ask this, you know, answer this question. What's wrong with punishing a misbehaving child? Aren't we supposed to punish them so they learn how to behave? Well, one problem with punishment is that it teaches children that if they want to influence another person's behavior, they should think about what they can do to that other person, take something away or inflict pain to get them to comply. What they don't think is, hmm, what can I do to solve this problem? So for example, I heard about a preschooler who told his little friend, get off the tricycle, I want to ride it. But I'm not finished, give it to me or I'm not your friend. This worked by the way doesn't sound as pretty when it comes out of a kid's mouth. The other question to ask related to punishment is, what do we want kids to think and feel when they do something wrong? Do we want them to focus on what TV shows they're gonna miss or how resentful they are because they didn't get any ice cream? Or do we want them to think about how to make it better, how to fix their mistake or what to do next time? So when you use problem solving instead of punishment, you'll feel like life has gotten a lot easier because you will be harnessing the extremely powerful will of your child and engaging it in a search for solutions rather than trying to fight it. So there are a number of steps for problem solving. The first is to acknowledge feelings. This puts you on your child's side. And I talked about that at the beginning of my talk, so that should sound familiar, right? When you acknowledge your child's feelings, you're not attacking him. You're trying to understand him and show him you understand. The next step is to describe the problem and ask for ideas. It's nice to write the ideas down and then you can decide together which ideas you both like. So here's an example of how it goes in real life. This story involves two brothers. It's a classic Cain and Abel tale. It was told by a mom in a parenting workshop. She said, Dustin is six, Gavin is two. Dustin is making a birthday card for his dad. Gavin, the two-year-old, is grabbing at the markers in the paper. Dustin shoves Gavin hard. Gavin falls, hits his head, and starts wailing. Mom is furious. I know Gavin is annoying you right now, but you can't push and hurt him. He's your brother. Dustin crumples the paper and yells, I don't care. He runs upstairs to his bedroom and slams the door. Mom goes upstairs after calming down Gavin and says to Dustin, I can see you're really angry. It can be frustrating to work with a two-year-old around. We need some ideas for how to solve this problem. Now, Dustin was still mad and definitely not interested in problem solving. So mom knew that it can be helpful to start with a silly or outrageous suggestion. She said, well, I'll go first. What about for number one, lock Gavin up in the dog crate. Dustin's face is suddenly transformed into a big smile. He says, put in number two, but leave it blank because I'm not gonna tell you it. Then he says, for number three, I could work in my room. Or number four, I could lock myself in the bathroom to work. Or number five, Gavin could play outside. Or number six, Gavin could watch Peter Pan video. Mom said, well, let's see what we wanna cross out and what we wanna keep. And Dustin says, well, you can't lock a, bo a boy in a dog crate, so cross that out. And mom said, well, Gavin can't play outside alone. He's only two. And Dustin said, well, now do number two, right? I won't push Gavin. Dustin went downstairs, got a fresh piece of paper and went to his room to make a birthday card for his father. Now think about what would have happened in a typical scenario. Maybe the kid is spanked or sent a timeout. What would he be thinking? Gee, I realize that I should show a lot more love and tenderness for my dear brother. After all, we do have shared genetic material. No, more likely he'd think, it's not fair, I hate him. 
He's always ruining everything. Mom always takes his side. I'm mean. But think about how much better after problem solving. He's probably thinking, it was a difficult problem, but I figured out a solution. Next time, I won't have to hurt him. Mom's not mad at me. She's proud of me. So there you have it. Three sets of tools for, in, uh, tools for engaging feelings. I'm sorry, tools for acknowledging feelings, tools for engaging cooperation, and the powerful tool of problem solving to resolve conflicts. I haven't talked about every tool in the book, but I promised to pause and take questions. So I know that somebody's going to be moderating. I'm ready for questions. These could be um, actual scenarios, actual situations. The, actually, the, the more specific, the better. And uh, I'll see if I can answer them. Okay, Julie, I'll, uh, I'll start with the last one that we received. And this is, how can we, what can we do to avoid fights between children? Uh, children four, five years old, uh, should you get involved? Should you defend the younger one? Uh, what do you do? How, which position are you going to take as a father or should you take as a parent? Okay, so I, I have to preface my answer by saying that I lead an eight hour workshop about on this very topic. I'm sorry, it's a 10 hour workshop on this very topic. It's a sort of big topic about how, what to do. So I'm gonna to try to say a few things that would be, would be helpful. Um, I, don't, I can't answer everything in, in, in a few minutes. Okay, so having said that, the question was, should I get involved or should I not? Five-year-olds don't necessarily know how to resolve conflict. Here's what I wanna suggest. It's not either I step in and solve it for them or I leave them to their own devices. There's a middle way. There's a third way, which is to step in and let's, let's imagine, let's see, what are they, they, they're fighting over who gets to sit in the front car seat. Let's, let's just make one up because I think that'll be helpful, right? We don't just leave them to duke it out and whoever's strongest gets in the car seat and the other one's left for the, in the back. No, we, 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 we use, I would use the same problem solving steps that I was just talking about for two kids. So now I have to acknowledge what each of them wants. Boy, that we have two children who both want to sit in the same car seat and there's only one of them. Maybe it's a front window seat and they both want that seat. So I'll first acknowledge what they both want. Hmm, we have two children and only one car seat that's, that's favorite. What should we do? Right? So what have I done? I've acknowledged what they each want. In this case, they want the same thing. So that's easier. <laughs> but sometimes it's not that. Sometimes I want to play alone. Oh, I want to play with him. I wanted to use that doll. No, I wanted to have a turn first. Like wh Whatever it is, we're not taking sides. We're just putting it towards what each of them wants. And we don't rush it. We wait until they, they each feel like I, the parent, get it. Because they're not able to listen to them to each other in that moment. They just want what they want. So when I... It actually reminds me of, um, I almost told this story in the talk, but I didn't have time. When, uh, when my oldest, his name is Asher, when he was four, he had a little friend named Matthew. And they actually did have a fight about who got to sit in the front seat. And I have to preface this by saying that when, <laughs> my son is now 31. So when he was a, a young child, kids were allowed to sit in the front. Now they're not allowed. So I just want you to know that <laughs> that's why they were fighting over it. And I did exactly what I was suggesting. I said, boy, we have two boys and they both want to sit in the front seat and we only have one of them. What should we do? And I have to admit to you that my first thought was to say, well, we should let Asher's friend sit in the front seat because he's the guest. But I decided I should use problem solving instead to see what they could come up with. And here's what happened. First, Matthew said, I should get to sit in the front seat because I'm the guest. And of course, I thought, well, that makes sense. That's what I was going to say. And then Asher said, my son said, but you sat in the front seat on the way here. So now it's my turn. And I thought, oh, I didn't even think about that. That's true. Matthew did sit in the front seat the last time. So it should be Asher's turn. Like, I don't know what to do. And we seemed to be at a at loggerheads with at a standstill. And I didn't know what to do. So I, I just I thought I'll put into words again what they're saying. Like, it's, it's, there's, there must be something about the front seat that you really like. And Matthew said, yeah, I like to sit in the front seat because I can see better out the front. And Asher said, well, I like to sit in the front seat because then you can control the music. You can pick the music that we listen to because you can reach the radio. And there was a pause. And Matthew said, I have an idea. How about I'll sit in the front seat and you tell me which music to put on? And Asher said, yeah. And suddenly they were best buddies again and they got in the car. 
Now, I'm going to admit to you, it doesn't always resolve that quickly and that well. But the idea is the same. We can, we can engage them in problem solving. And if you think about it, what have I done? I haven't just resolved that particular conflict. I've also given them a process for what do we do when we have a conflict with another person. Rather than trying to overwhelm them with our strength, we try to figure out what do you want and what do you need? What do I want and what do I need? And what can we think of that will meet both of our needs? And that's I, that I would argue is such a valuable skill, very hard to learn, right? Even as adults, we're practicing this with, with our partners and other people in our lives. But if we can teach our children this tool for resolving conflict from a young age, we, we will have given them a huge gift. Yeah, that's true. Thank you for that. Um, how can you deal with children when they use bad words or nasty words as a way of defending in any conflict? Uh, how how can you deal with that? What should you do? Kids use bad language for different reasons. We actually have a whole chapter about it in our new book. Um, but one of the reasons why kids use what I would call bad language is because those words have huge emotional power, right? When we're really, I think about when adults curse. When do we curse? It's when we have really strong, angry feelings. And we feel like I need language that will express those feelings. And when that's happening, here's what doesn't help. Uh, 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 we don't use that language in this, in this family. Don't use that word, right? Think about it as an adult. Imagine you had a tough day at work where your boss told you you had to write a report. He didn't give you the data you need. It's all his, he embarrasses you in front of everybody by saying, well, how come you didn't get it done? And it's your own fault. And you're just, you're steaming you're furious you come home and you say to your partner my boss is such a jerk i'm going to use the word jerk because we're on zoom but you fill it in with whatever word you can think of right let's say you're using a very strong word and the first thing your partner says to you is honey we don't use that word in this family notice where all your anger goes immediately from that boss right towards your partner right I don't want you criticizing my language when I'm trying to explain to you why I'm so angry. So what's, what's a better approach? We can rephrase what our child is feeling. We can use the language that we would want them to use. We can model it for them. Boy, you sound so angry at your brother. You sound furious. That, that's going to help a child feel understood. It's actually going to help them calm down. When a child is that upset and angry, they actually, their, their, their thinking brain disconnects from their emotional brain. They're sort of down here and we need to get them reconnected so that they can actually think clearly. So by giving them the language, by showing them we get it, by not first criticizing the words, we can help them feel understood, help them calm down. And when they're in a, a better place, we can say, you know, it upsets me to hear you use that language. That particular word is hard for me to hear. I much prefer if you say, I am furious or give them, Get out the thesaurus and give them a bunch of language tool, uh, words that they can use instead. Yes, and 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 what happens uh, when your child hits you when he gets angry or frustrated? Uh, it's a six-year-old, so the question is, what can I do uh, that he listens that he must not hit me when he's frustrated or angry? Yeah. So a six-year-old who's hitting is having a hard time controlling his impulses and controlling his anger. So we want to we want to work on that over time. Um, in the moment, if you're asking me what do you do in the moment, I would I would stop him from hitting me. I would I would show him that I I don't let people hit me, and that's the language I would use. The language is important. I'd say I won't let myself be hit, right? I, I mean, you don't have to be a purist if you say I won't let you hit me. That's okay too. But the reason I actually say I won't let myself be hit is because if we can avoid saying that word you, we avoid putting the child on a defensive. We avoid them feeling bad or shamed, and we just focus on the behavior that I won't allow, right, which is to let myself be hit. And don't let yourself be hit. Step away or hold his hands. We're going to take action to make sure that we're protecting ourselves. Sometimes people say to me, like, what if they're throwing things? Like, I'm not going to just say you're in a throwing mood and let them, like, crash things against the window. No, we're going to take action because we need to protect people. We need to protect property. In this case, I need to protect myself. Uh, you know, I want him to I do want him to learn how to control his rage. 
uh, control his impulses, but I'm not going to let him, I'm not going to address that before I protect myself first. But that's just not where it ends. Once I've said that, once I've stepped away or held his hands, I'm still going to say, you are so angry or whatever it is that was happening. Like put into words what's going on for this child. You thought you were going to go to your friend's house. And when you heard, I can't drive you, that made you so mad. You don't want to hear, I don't have time to drive you. You want to go right now. Listen, when you feel that way, you can tell me, mom, I'm very upset. I'm very angry. I told him I was going to go to his house. You can't tell me I can't go now, right? I'm speaking for him. I'm actually modeling the language and the way I would say, have him say it, right? Um, it's because that's the goal. The goal is for when he's frustrated, when he is feeling like, how can you tell me no when I really want to do this thing? We want him to be able to say it rather than to resort to feet and fists, right? So I'm going to, I'm going to stop the hitting. I'm going to stop the behavior. I'm gonna, the language I'm going to use is I won't let myself be hit, right? But I'm not going to stop there because I need to, I need to help him de-escalate. And I need to give him the language that he that he's going to eventually use when he's that angry. That will help him express that feeling that it feels like it's an eruption in his body. It feels like it has to come out. We want it to come out in words, not in fists. And that's one way he's going to learn how to do that. Now, the other thing I just want to add is that sometimes I'll ask parents, did you see it coming? Oh, yeah, I knew he was going to be so mad when I told him he couldn't go to his friend's house. I could. I just knew it was, he was going to start hitting. I said, then you preemptively can say, this is going to make you mad because it's so disappointing, right? Give him the language up front. Give, it, give him ahead of time. See if you can get in there before he resorts to fists because that's our goal. It's not that we want him to not feel frustrated. Of course, he's going to be disappointed. He, he had a plan. He had a friend. He told them he was going to play and then he found out he can't. We need to help him learn how to manage that, that feeling, that frustration. And if we give him the language, the, the actual words he can say, that's going to be a great first step for him to learn what to do instead of screaming or, or hitting or kicking, which a lot of kids still do when they're six. I, I have two questions that are related to, well, no, a lot of them, but uh, two are mostly related. One is, how can you talk to children that frustrate easily or quickly? How, what can you say there? Or how can you talk to them? It, if you do, you have an idea of of situations where they're they're easily frustrated. Uh, I would. I would. Okay. I am. O sea, whoever wrote the question, I'm going to ask her for that. And on the meantime, ask oh, okay. something that's related to this. And that is, she says, after my daughter destroys house items or disrespects me, she says, I hurt her feelings when I tell her that she behaved. Uh, that her behavior is disrespectful or that we're a loving family and that her actions or words don't show love. She turns everything around. What can I do? <laughs> I'm not talking about love right now, honey. I'm talking about what about the problem of things being destroyed in the house, <laughs> items being thrown that are breakable. That's what upsets me. This is not about how much I love you. So let's let's not fall for that. It's when I say the the glasses are not for throwing. It has nothing to do with whether I love you or not. That's we're not talking about that right now. Um, and here this other one, uh, a child five years old. Uh, he plays in a game. Uh, they usually play these board games, but her sister wins, so he gets frustrated and he's just going to destroy the game. How can you handle that frustration in that moment or how to tell him that after that he has to uh, ask for, uh, say sorry? Yeah, yeah. I think that a lot of us as parents have memories of playing games, win-lose games that we enjoyed as kids. And so we want that for our children. And I think sometimes we forget that it's sort of a, it's a developmental skill to be able to play a win-lose game and be okay with following rules and losing. And this child, he might not be quite ready to do that, especially with his sister, especially if he's always losing. It's actually not a whole lot of fun to play a game where you're always losing. Um, so there's a different, there's a couple different ways you can go. With my youngest kids, when they wanted to play games, 
they wanted to change the rules. I said, fine, you know, play. Why don't you come up with rules that work for you? And they would change the rules and it wouldn't be about winning and losing. And it would be about like, they had fun rolling the dice and seeing how many spaces they could go. And if they didn't like where they landed, they would change the rules and they had a great time. Of course, it might be that this little boy would like to play that way, but his sister does not. So I can help them negotiate. Well, how do you want to play? We have to find a way that works for both of you. When my oldest was, he was older than five, but he was interested in chess. And my husband was a chess player and said, I'll teach you how to play chess. So he taught him all the rules and then they played chess. And my husband would play his hardest and he would always beat my son. And my son very quickly, as you might imagine, lost interest in playing chess until I suggested, you know, it's not really an even match. Why don't you ask him if he wants to have special daddy rules so to make it a little bit more fair and a little bit more fun. And so that's what they did. They came up with rules that daddy would give him a little hint if he was about to move his, you know, his pawn in front of the king or whatever. I don't play chess, right? But um, they changed the rules. So it was more fun for my son. And it was more fun for my husband because otherwise my son didn't want to play and he got, got mad and upset about it. So, so, so kids do this all the time on the playground. If we just leave them to their devices, they change the rules to make it more fun for everybody. And I might suggest this for these two, the sister and brother, like, how could you, what could you do that would make it fun for both of you, right? I, you want to acknowledge your sister likes playing this game and you kind of want to play it, but it's frustrating because it's hard to, it's, it, it's hard to play when you're always losing. I wonder if there's something you could do so here what I did, I acknowledged both of their feelings first. And then I say, I wonder if there's something you could do to change the game so it would be fun for both of you. Then you do the hardest thing as a parent, nothing. You let them talk, <laughs> let them negotiate and see if they can come up with something. Now, that's great. But this question is interesting because it says, which, what, what can we do? Which tool can we use when we have situations like the ones you're mentioning, for example, the car chair or something like that, but we're late. We're delayed, and we don't have the time. Yes, yes, yes. And that so happens a lot. <laughs> let me thank you for that question because you're right. I, I don't want to suggest that you can always stop life and do this. Sometimes this is what I would say to my kids. I hear that you both want the front seat, and we don't have time to figure out who's going to, you know, a better system for who should sit there. So right now, I'm going to decide, and somebody's going to be unhappy. And we should figure out later, we should figure out a system for the next time so this doesn't happen again. And I would absolutely say, I don't have time for this. And, and, and acknowledge that somebody's gonna be unhappy about it. But I do think if, if you have, a, I just had a, a parent who said every single morning her kids fight over the car seats. She's got four kids and they're always fighting about who gets to sit where. And she says, it's a nightmare. They're trying to get somewhere. And, um, and, and so we talked about, problem solving with them, not in the moment. In the moment, you're going to decide and somebody's going to be unhappy. But let's find a time to say, this is this is not working for us in the morning. Everybody wants to, you know, a seat, their special seat in the front. And there's been a lot of fighting and nobody's happy about this. We need a plan, you know, before tomorrow morning so we know who's going to get to, who, whose turn it's going to be and when, the, when you're going to have a turn. It, that works much better. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Now, I'm going to change a little bit because there's one question here that it says, this is great, but how can we take this to the classroom? Uh, in which cases is it necessary to have a consequence uh, from the school uh, <laughs> of a child that, <laughs> <don't fear>. uh, <laughs> that were misbehaving? And when is it better to, to talk, or, or, I don't know, to, to, talk, to see the bad behavior with all these tools that you're mentioning? So the question is, I have to give a consequence at school. I guess I'm not. Yeah, yeah. Not the sure point is that it, yes. The the question is, in which cases is it necessary to have a consequence from the school because of a bad behavior, or when would it be better to have this uh, tools that you're you're teaching? Okay. Of? Listen, sometimes you're not, just like that last question, sometimes you don't have time to do this. Sometimes you don't have the manpower to do this because it requires the adult to, to slow down and acknowledge what's going on for each kid and say, what should we do, right? A lot of classrooms have been introducing this whole problem-solving model 
and teaching it to kids and simplifying it, put it putting a poster on the wall. So maybe not the two and three year olds, but the five year olds can can follow the steps and you can even train kids to be mediators. So they're the ones who are helping when there's two kids who have a conflict. The third child can come and say, we're going to follow these steps and they can walk them through the steps I just walked you through in a simplified form. And for certain kinds of problems, kids can start to do this on their own. So I would, you know, if you're not doing this with your with your kids in a classroom, this can be a great way to help resolve conflicts without the teacher having to be involved all the time. Of course, you know, the kids will need to have help learning how to do this. And again, like I said before, sometimes you don't have time. Sometimes you have to say, I'm, you know, one kid's kicking another, you're trying to do a circle time lesson. You know, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to move you. I see it's too hard to control your feet. I'm moving you over. I'm, you know, you're going to have to sit outside the circle for now. But if it's the same child, if it's the same, you know, the same problem of a kid always kicking his neighbor or um, create, you know, creating problems, grabbing kids' toys or whatever it is, I don't think that 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 consequence is enough because it doesn't teach the child what to do in that moment, how to manage that urge that he has to kick or to grab. And, and that's where we can work on long-term not having that problem again and again. Because I had a, a teacher in one of my workshops and she said, you know, we give timeouts, timeouts, that's what they call it, to a child who is misbehaving. And she said, the problem is it's the same children over and over and over again. It's not working, they're not learning what to do so that they don't get sent to timeout They're, because they have they have more skills that they need to develop, whether it's impulse control or conflict resolution, learning to, to notice their own urges and then to control them. And that's what we want to work on for the long term. Right. So now related to that, uh, there's a question here that says that uh, they have a, an eight year old son. And he gets annoyed because he doesn't like uh, break time to finish in school. The point is how what how can you deal with his anger when because he has to follow the rules he has to stick to the rules so sure. how can you deal with that? Okay, so you know whenever I hear an issue like this, I ask myself, what's going on, and can I relate to it? And if this is an eight year old who feels like I'm working on this this exercise, you gave me this math problem or whatever it is, right? And I'm, I, I'm trying to figure it out. And now you say you have to stop in the middle. I ask myself, what, how can I relate to that feeling? I can relate to that feeling. If I'm working on an email and my husband comes and says, you have to come for dinner. I mean, even though I'm hungry, I'm like, ah, I want to finish the, the email first, right? We know that feeling of like, I want to finish. And I think that the, I'm not suggesting that we then let him do that. Because in a classroom where you have a lot of kids, we don't often have the flexibility for that. But Short of that, what would I want as an adult? I'd want a little heads up. Honey, we're, we're going to be eating dinner in five minutes. Whatever you can, you find a stopping place or wrap it up, right? A little heads up can be really helpful for adults and it might be helpful for this eight year old also. And if we acknowledge it's hard to stop, it's hard to find a stopping place. Maybe he even needs a little help. Oh, look, it looks like you've got half of it done here. If you put, if you write down your, your thinking here, then it'll be easier to come back after lunch and finish it up. Um, that also can help. So again, see what I'm doing is I'm looking for ways to, to, first of all, relate to what's this child experiencing? And then how can we help them in this moment without saying, oh, well, go ahead, honey. You just spend the time. You can just sit here for all, as long as you want while the rest of the, the class goes out. So. Yeah, perfect. Now. Uh, coming back to family, uh, <laughs> jealous. When you have brothers, sisters, siblings, uh, how can you make them all feel important for parents? Uh, do you recommend spending time alone with each one of them? Uh, how to protect the one that, especially the youngest without the eldest feeling kind of hurt or left apart or something like that? How can you deal with that? This is this is a great question. And, and, you know, we've written, there's an entire book written about just this topic. So, you know, there's so much I could say. Let me just, let me just say, you asked about one-on-one uh, -on -one time with each child. I'm a huge fan of, of what, what I call special time with each child. And it doesn't mean you have to take them out to Disneyland or some special place. You can literally go in their room and sit on the floor and say, what should we play for 10 minutes? I'm all yours. And put your phone away, 
close the door so the other kids can't interrupt and just focus on this one child that that alone has saved a lot of headaches and a lot of conflict in a lot of families so that that uh, absolutely yes if you can do it and i am aware that that can be very challenging if you have several children if you have a busy life it might feel like i can't do it think about how much time you spend with the kids fighting and and feeling jealous and all the all the not just the time but the draining energy that it takes to deal with that and see if you can just carve out even if it's i mean i hate to say 10 minutes is, is practically nothing for a child but even 10 minutes can make a difference um and then sometimes parents ask me my kids get jealous because you know this one needed new shoes and that one wanted new shoes and the message is it's hard to see your sister get new shoes it makes you want to get new shoes too and even though you know that her you know that your feet haven't grown yet and so you don't need new shoes you kind of wish you did you wish they grew so that you could get new shoes it's hard to wait right so i'm not caving in i'm not saying well come on honey let's go get you some too not that i'm just i, I shouldn't say just because it's not so easy i'm acknowledging that it's hard to see your sibling get something that you want i think sometimes we're afraid to say that because we don't want to we're afraid we're going to make that feeling stronger but the opposite tends to be the case now the child feels like okay you get it you understand how much how hard it is how jealous i feel i don't like that you're giving her more attention i don't like that you're buying her something so i think we're out of time here and i just wanted to make Shall I make a, a closing comment? Um, although people have stuck around, it looks like we could do this for hours. Um, <laughs> yes, and, and you can't imagine, it. we do have a lot of questions anyway, but yes, we could go on for hours, so. <laughs> well, you know, let, let me just, I hope it's okay if I make a pitch, because a yeah. lot of these questions we do address in our books. We have the two books and they have been translated into Spanish. So there's the how to talk so little kids will listen. and I was going to try to say it in Spanish, but I'm not sure I remember. Como hablar? I'm not going to try. <laughs> Como hablar para que los hijos escuchen. O para, que los... para que los pequeños escuchen. Exacto. exacto. Sí. <laughs> um, and then we have Como hablar cuando los niños no escuchen. <laughs> I think that's how you say it. How to talk when kids won't listen. And the subtitle of that one, I'll say it slowly for the translator, is Whining, Fighting, meltdowns, defiance, and other challenges of childhood. So a lot of these issues are addressed in the book. We have a lot of short chapters on different topics, like the name calling and bad language. I only answered part of that question. There's more in the book. Um, there's there's a chapter on kids fighting. There's lots of, lots of hot topics like the ones that you've been asking me about. And let me just make one more comment before we, before we end, which is to say that sometimes when i give a talk i think people feel like oh my gosh like who could do all of this all the time this is sort of overwhelming it's like it sounds great but it's like how can i do this and yes i want to say you're right we don't have to be perfect we're only human if you say something unhelpful don't beat yourself up about it and don't worry because your kids will misbehave again and you'll have a chance to try something else next time that's the good news <laughs> and uh, th this whole method was um, inspired by a child psychologist, uh, Chaim Gannat, who used to say, you know, you don't have to be orthodox, you can be reform. We can aim for 70%, that's a good aim. Some days, 50% is all we can manage. And sometimes even just 10% can make a difference in the relationship, right? It is possible to change the way we talk to our kids. I see it all the time with my clients and in my workshops, and I think we're giving them a gift. We're giving them tools for respectful communication and tools for resolving conflict that they can take with them into adulthood. And one more thing, I would genuinely love to hear from you if, if, if you use these tools in real life with your kids. I, I, I think that um, you've gotten my my website and my, my contact information. Please yes. write. I want Yes. yes, but I think it's important to leave it here. Así que, Daniel, I was going to ask you if you, we can write down your website and Facebook and Instagram account because, uh, because of what you're saying. I think it's, it would be really interesting to follow you and to send you all this. So, yeah, so I'm going to put it in. Great. Oh, I, 
talk, type to type fast, how to talk for parents. That's my Instagram. Um, right. Yes. And if you're interested in more in-depth work and if you speak English, um, I do online workshops that I have people from all over the world who participate and it gives people an opportunity to ask these kinds of questions and to practice these tools because it's one thing to understand them. It's another thing to put it into practice. So um, I, do, I work, I also work one on one with people and I do workshops online. So th that's also available for people if they're interested. And thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you for inviting me and for, for attending <laughs> and for asking all your questions. Thank you, Julie. Uh, we, as you say, yes, there was a lot of interest and we could go on for a long, long, long time, but uh, but we, okay, have to follow you and have to get into this uh, websites and all that. Uh, yeah. But it was really, really interesting, fascinating. Danielle is having trouble with the internet, so I don't think he will be able to close it, as you have seen, that he connects and disconnects. Uh, yes, I would like to thank you. Aita, Daniel, I don't know if he wants to say goodbye. He's having trouble, say. Yeah. <laughs> One second. One second, yes. Now I think it's much better. I'm yeah. sorry about it. Say. Te escuchamos perfecto. Estábamos cerrando y tenías dificultades. Te estábamos esperando. Sí, muchas gracias, Julie. Muchas gracias eh, a todos los que y todas las que se conectaron. Eh, esta grabación se va a enviar a cada una de las personas, a los distintos colegios. Eh, gracias, Mónica, nuevamente por, eh, por, por, por dar la cabida a todas las la, la, la respuestas, eh, coordinar las preguntas, eh, invitar a todos los papás y mamás que hoy día estuvieron con nosotros a revisar esta, esta tremenda oportunidad que tuvimos de poder estar en taller con Julie King eh, y agradecerle nuevamente por su asistencia. Me disculpo, cambiaron la hora en Chile y en México, eh, se descoordinó. Pensé que era una sola hora, como fue el programa al comienzo, y habían dos eh, de diferencia. Eh, les pido mil disculpas por ello. Eh, Espero que podamos, en algún minuto, apenas termine esto, mañana vamos a enviar la grabación. Eh, y, y la verdad fue un error eh, por el cambio de hora, que cuando se programó eh, había una sola y después que pasó a dos. Así que, eh, nuevamente, mil disculpas. Agradezco eh, a todo el interés, a todas las personas que se conectaron, y ya vamos a estar en una próxima oportunidad con un nuevo taller. Muchas gracias.